Hello, for the next 20 minutes or so, I want to look at uh, chapter 5 of Wheelock's Latin. It's a fairly short chapter, and I think a fairly easy chapter, but it introduces you primarily to two new tenses, the future tense and the imperfect tense. So let's dive right in with Wheelock's Latin chapter 5. Okay, so remember the present tense? Way back a long time ago in the very first chapter of Wheelock, we learned laudo, laudas, laudat, laudamus, laudatus, laudant, and we learned that in Latin you can actually say something that takes more than one word. It would, in one word in Latin, you can say something that actually takes several words in English to say. So laudo, even though it's only one word in Latin, really translates into English as I praise. We talked about how Latin is an inflected language rather than a syntactical language. English, you know what a word is doing primarily by the order it comes in a sentence. But in Latin, it is really the endings of the words. This omega, for example, uh, not omega, that's Greek. This uh, o, long o, tells you that the, the subject of this verb is I. The long a-s tells you that the subject of this verb is a singular you, not many you, not a y'all, not a use but a you singular, a thou. The T tells you that the subject is a he, a she, or an it. Uh, we, y'all, um, and they. This should hopefully sound familiar uh, from the very first chapter of Wheelock. And even if that was confusing um, some four chapters ago, I hope that today when I review this you're thinking, yeah, you're right, that, that seemed really strange and difficult the very first time I saw it, but now... I'm a pro. Well, assuming that you're a pro, uh, oh, well, let me tell you about the second conjugation. Remember that um, the Romans all got together one day and they, they got all the verbs together and they put them into four groups. First group, second group, uh, third group, and fourth group. Four conjugations, we call it. The first conjugation uh, is the A conjugation. You'll know that there's a preponderance of A's, and A is the first letter of the alphabet, so why wouldn't the first conjugation be the, the group of A's? The A conjugation, the first conjugation, is fairly regular, which is really nice. It doesn't do you know as much crazy stuff as the third conjugation, for example. Well, uh, so you, ha you had the first conjugation in Chapter 1, the first group of verbs, the A verbs, and you can see these A's um, in the... Uh, now. The first person singular doesn't have an A. You know, who knew? But get used to it. Languages are sloppy. Uh, but the rest of them have A's. Uh, and the infinitive, of course, laudare, uh, you might remember, R-E ending. Uh, uh, the imperative, lauda, a command, you singular, praise, or laudate, y'all, praise. Um, that was all first, first chapter stuff. And we also had in the first chapter the second conjugation, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. This is the E conjugation. Look at the E's. We have E's, everything's coming up E's in the second conjugation. But the same endings. In fact, you're going to get a lot of pound for your buck um, uh, for the, the endings. O-S-T, M-U-S-T-I-S-N-T, O-S-T, M-U-S-T-I-S-N-T. Those endings, first person singular, second person singular, you know, I, you, he, she, or it, we, you, plural, they. Those endings are going to show up over and over again. In fact, even as we jump into the future and the imperfect tense, it's called, uh, in Latin, we're going to find these same endings. Well, I didn't know I was going to get so much mileage out of buying those basic endings. O, S, T, M, U, S, T, I, S, N, T. Um, so those en endings are going to be used on the next slide when we get into the future tense. But uh, the second conjugation is the second group of verbs. So the first group of verbs had long A's. The second uh, group of verbs had E's. Uh, and the infinitive is monera with a long E, R-E. Um, so the second person singular command, mone, warn, and the plural, second person plural command, moneta, y'all, warn. Um, so, uh, hopefully again, that sounds like something you've had in the past that you remember. I warn, thou warnst, uh, a singular you warn, um, a he, a she, an it warns, a we warn, you plural, y'all uses warn, warn 
Uh, they warn, some they, Romani warn, you know, the Romans warn, some they, uh, for the third person plural. So, I'm hoping that all of that sounds really familiar. Uh, the endings, O, S, T, M, U, S, T, I, S, N, T, uh, that give you the person and number of the verb. Uh, and then these two groups, the first two bags that we put the verbs into, the first bag of long A's and the second bag of long E's. All of this is review. Now, launching into chapter 5. Welcome to the future. The future is very easy in Latin. It, it involves a B. So you're going to stick this B in between the stem, lauda. How do I know the stem? I know it because I just chopped the RE off the infinitive, and I've got the stem. So it would be monet uh, with the second conjugation. Uh, the B is going to be your sign of, of the future, this B right here is the big sign uh, that you're looking at the future. Now, the imperfect has a B too, but, but let's hold off on that. So you'll notice the endings are the same. O-S-T. M-U-S-T-I-S-N-T. -S -S so I will praise. You singular will praise. A he, a she, or an it will praise. We will praise. Y'all will praise. And some they will praise. Notice the vowels. Um, connecting so you have the you have the stem the loud da all of these have a loud da that first conjugation stem for this word they all have a b for the future um, and then uh, they have the same endings o s t m u s t i s n t uh, and then notice the connecting vowels it's i o u i o u so you have i's in most of them and then you have an O in the first person singular, that's predictable. And then you have a U in the third person plural. So I, the future is, you know, I have an IOU for the future, uh, for these vowels. I think Wheelock said something about bo, be, 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 be. You know, it kind of sounds like baby talk. I don't know if that helps you, uh, but um, it was a, a moment of joy in reading Wheelock. Uh, so, hopefully you get this. You can't ask me questions because this is a recording. But, um, very simple. Bo bis bit bimis bitis bunt. Bo bis bit bimis bitis bunt. Bo bis bit bimis bitis bunt. That's the future. I will praise. You singular will praise. A he, she, or it will praise. We will praise. Y'all will praise. They will praise. I don't know what more to say. It's it's just pretty simple. But notice notice how many English words come out of one word in Latin. Again, this is something to get used to. Languages do things differently. So, laudabo means I will praise. All of those three words come out of that one word. Uh, and you can, you can align the translation with different parts of it. So, the I jumps out of the O. The will jumps out of the B. And the praise uh, jumps out of the lauda. I hope that's helpful, but this is just notes on Wheelock, so you'll have to go read Wheelock, um, and hopefully that will help you more, and of course, hopefully you have a teacher uh, somewhere helping you as well. Now, let's look at the imperfect. The imperfect is very Fred Flintstone. Bam, bam! Um, so, uh, the imperfect uh, is very similar to the future, but it has a ba. Uh, there, are no, there were no A's in the future. Remember, the future involved an I-O-U. Um, but the imperfect involves A's. Bam, ba, spot, bama, spot, is bont. Bam, ba, spot, bama, spot, is bont. So this A, and, and by the way, he gives you a helpful a mnemonic to remember this, because the future um, has an I, as in bo, bis, bit, bimis, bit, is bunt. But the, the past, like the word was, the word was has an A in it. And notice that was shows up in some of the translations. So, if you can think of the imperfect was, and was has an A in it, that might r remind you that bam, ba, spot, bama, spot, is bont. Um, so, laudabam, laudabas, laudabat, laudaba, laudabamas, laudabatis, laudabant. If the second to last syllable is long, that's where the stress goes. If the second to last syllable isn't long, then the stress goes on the third to last syllable. So this is laudabamas, because that A is long. 
but here it's laudabant uh, because the A here is sh uh, short. Well, anyway, that would be the last syllable. Anyway, it's not important right now. The imperfect, um, and by the way, let me let me pronounce the future um, so that you get the pronunciation. Laudabo, laudabis, laudabit. Laudabimus, laudabitus, laudabunt. The reason why you pronounce the third to last syllable here is because the second to last syllable is is short. Uh, pronunciation uh, in my book is not real important unless you're going to be a purist. Um, uh, you're going to be able, because this is about reading uh, Latin rather than uh, speaking it, I suspect. Okay. So, bam, bas, bat, bam, bat, bam, is the imperfect. What is the imperfect? Well, um, you know, English um, probably has taken a turn that makes words like the perfect tense or the imperfect tense uh, a little confusing because when we use the word perfect, we think, you know, he was the perfect gentleman, you know, or I'm sorry, I'm imperfect. You know, perfect and imperfect in English have come to mean uh, flawless and having flaws. That's not really the older sense of the word perfect. And if you're a Bible reader, um, the word perfect is probably not a really good translation these days uh, in a lot of places. Um, but um, really, perfect and imperfect in this sense has more to do with complete and incomplete. Uh, so the imperfect tense has to do with action in the past that was continuous or ongoing. So I was praising as opposed to I praised. I praised kind of has a complete feel to it. Not exactly, but it, it's it's kind of just throws it out there. I, I, I praised. You know, there was a day when I praised. Um, but with the imperfect tense, there's more of an ongoing I was praising, or I used to praise. Wheelock mentions that there's more than one way to translate an imperfect tense. So uh, he suggests you could translate it, I, I used to pray. When I was in college, I used to praise all the time. You know, or, or I kept praising, I just couldn't stop. You would use an imperfect tense to translate, I kept praising. So context, you're going to want to feel, you know, trust the force, Luke. You know what, feel the context and try to translate it accordingly. Uh, but the imperfect, and by the way, Spanish, I think, does this, uses bomb, I mean the B-A, uh, for, for its its past as well. Um, so that that's uh, an added bonus. But anyway, so I was praising, you were praising, uh, he, she, or it was praising, we were praising, you plural were praising, they were praising. That would be a starter, you know, the rated G version translation uh, of the imperfect in Latin, um, but you know you can you can go a little further. I, I used to praise. I, I kept praising. I tr uh, in in uh, maybe in some cases it can go even further. I tried to praise. I began to praise. You know, feel get a feel for it. You're not invent. Don't invent stuff. Just kind of get a feel for what you know what it seems to be saying. Get in touch with your inner Roman. Uh, so the future tense I will praise. The imperfect tense I was praising. Read the book. Okay, a couple other things. Um, you remember puer? Puer was a noun uh, that meant boy, and it was a little, it didn't go with the, you know, amicus had a U.S. on it. I liked that. Uh, amicus. Uh, it was normal. Puer didn't have a U.S. on the end. Puer was nominative, masculine, singular, but it didn't have a U.S. on it, and that, that troubled me. I lost sleep over that. Um, uh, but it wasn't that hard. Uh, basically, puer was the nominative singular. It showed up again in the vocative singular. But the you know the rest of it pretty much you know followed the the same pattern. Well, I don't think it's really that hard. In fact, you would have pretty much caught it without realizing you caught it. But there are some adjectives uh, that do the same thing. Uh, so, for example, uh, the book f uh, and this should be a long I. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Liber, uh, with a long I, means free. Liberty, uh, by the way, uh, not to be confused with liber, and I've done you a great disservice by not going back to put the long mark over the I. Liber, libera, liberum. Uh, li, the, the long I indicates that this is the adjective that means free. There is a noun, liber, that means book, like library. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway... 
the adjective is liber, and it means free. And so uh, you'll notice that the nominative singular, nominative masculine singular, doesn't follow our nice chart. The good news is, is that's the only form that doesn't cover co uh, follow the, the nice chart. All the other forms, masculine, feminine, neuter, singular, plural, uh, genitive, dative, accusative, vocative, all of the other forms follow the chart. Uh, and so it's just the nominative that's a little weird. Um, there's no vocative uh, form for adjectives. Just use the nominative uh, if you're modifying a vocative. Okay, so um, this is so it's really not. Oh, you got me all worked up. It's no big deal, right? It's no big big deal. The only strangeness is in the nominative singular, and you're going to learn that strangeness when you memorize the word. Slightly, slightly more irritating is this form, polcare. Why? Because that that e in polcare goes away in all of its other forms. Polcare, but look at the feminine, polcra, polcrum. You know, the E popped up, popped out like a pimple. You know, where did it go? I don't know. Um, so um, there are ER adjectives like liber, where the E stays everywhere. Um, the only weird form is the nominative masculine singular. You're going to learn that when you learn the vocabulary liber. Uh, then there are ER adjectives like polcare, where the E goes away everywhere, but the nominative masculine singular, um, and if you were modifying evocative. But anyway, um, so the E is going to go away. Uh, now, if you're going from Latin to English, who cares? Because the Latin will already have either gotten rid of the E or kept the E. If you want to know how to predict it, uh, derivatives in English often help. So a derivative of liber is liberty. And notice that in liberty, the E is there. Now, I don't know if you know the word pulchritude, uh, but there is a word about the beautiness, you know, the be beautissimousness, you know, of something. How beautiful something is. Polcar means beautiful, um, and you'll notice that in pol in the English word pulchritude, the e is gone. Um, again, pulchritude is not a word I use very often. I never use the word pulchritude. So, but derivatives can help you know uh, how, whether it's like that the e goes away or, or or not in these. But like I said, all the other endings are intact except for the nominative singular. And most of the time you're going to be going from Latin to English anyway, so who cares, right? Why did you waste all this time going over this? I didn't even need to know this. Um, so the, the, the point is there are some ER adjectives that are like puer was a noun that did something like this. And you, you remember with the noun, there, was also, there were also nouns like puer. Puer keeps the E. So you, you may know the English word pueril, somebody who's boyish, not mature. Um, the E stays in the English word pueril. Um, the um, the other example of a noun like this, though, in that chapter was agir, and in agir the the e goes away in its other forms. What what is an English derivative? Agriculture. Is there an e between the g and the r in agriculture? No, there isn't. So again, the derivative helps you know whether the e stays or goes. But really, it's nothing to lose sweat about. If you're running out of brain space, you know my brain is full. Please let me go. You know, don't worry about this piece. I did come find a couple of stuff. I lied one more slide. I did find a couple of things in the vocabulary that I thought it were worth mentioning. There are some words that are indeclinable. As English speakers, we prize these words. These are words that don't have a genitive, a dative, an accusative. Like the, the, the uh, Greek, uh, the Latin word satis, satis, which means enough. Uh, by the way, a common expression in Latin is to say enough of money. Um, rather, We would say enough money in English. Uh, in Latin, they would prefer to say enough of money and put money in the, the genitive, uh, satis, uh, satis uh, pecuniae. Uh, but anyway, um, but satis is undeclinable. It doesn't take different cases. Another thing uh, that you see in the vocabulary is that there, there are certain words, uh, conjunctions especially, uh, that are called post-positives. You know, you know anybody who's always running a little late? Uh, post-positives are always running a little late. You can always count on them to come in, you know, about five minutes after the meeting's begun. Um, so, igatur, uh, which means therefore, um, is never going to come where you would want it to come in English. So, in English, I would say, uh, uh, therefore, let us praise. Uh, but in Latin, that's going to be uh, gaudiamus igatur. And, and the igatur is going to come after the word, it, sh it should have been in front of let us praise. But in Latin, it's going to be a little late, uh, usually second, 
Uh, so uh, little odds and ends that are tucked away uh, in chapter 5. Thank you very much uh, for being a part of this uh, 20 minutes and 6 second uh, presentation on Wheelock chapter 5.